Amen. Amen. All right, if you have a Bible, uh, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, you might have one on your phone. Uh, if you don't have one on your phone or you don't have a physical copy with you, uh, under the seats in front of you, there should be a Bible that looks exactly like this. Um, so, so we're going to be in Ephesians chapter uh, 1, uh, sorry, chapter 2 rather, uh, and, and we are going to be tackling um, a topic that really is the theme of the series. It's, it's from death to life. And so we kicked off this series in, in chapter 1 uh, with, with the Apostle Paul, this explosion of worship as, God, as Paul pens this um, uh, song of praise, song of blessing uh, over the church uh, of, of Ephesus, um, uh, communicating with them that every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is ours in Christ Jesus. And then he launched directly into a, an incredibly worshipful prayer uh, for the church there in Ephesus, which also applies to us who are in Christ. And so uh, today uh, we're going to tackle Ephesians uh, chapter 2, just uh, the first 10 verses there. And let, why don't you read with me before we pray? And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all were also once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He has for us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with Him and seated with, uh, with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works so that one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Father, we pray that this service would be one that would bring glory, praise, and honor to the name of Jesus. God, we ask that you would be here present among us, that you would be speaking to our hearts, that whatever kind of preconceived ideas we walked into this room with about uh, who Jesus is or what Christianity is all about, that we would leave those at the door and that we would, we would explore in your word who you say you are, who, we say, who, who you say we are as well. God, help us to gain a greater understanding of, of, of just what the process of salvation looks like. God, we want your name to be magnified in this place today. And so we lift up the name of Jesus and ask that you would speak to our hearts now. In your name we pray. Amen. Do you want to know your future? For sure. The answer is yes, you do. Um, uh, most people do. Most people desire to know the future. What, what's God's plans for my life? What, what are my kind of, quote unquote, next steps? And there are many people who fraudulently would tell you, yeah, sure, I, I can tell you your future. Come sit down with me. I'll rub this crystal ball. Or I'll read these uh, cards and I'll, I'll share with you all about what your, your future is and what it entails. And, and I can remember being in Israel several years back at a little trinket store. I'm just trying to get some gifts, right, to bring home from the Holy Land. And there this lady approaches me and she's like, hey, um, do you want to know your future? And I was like, I already know my future. I don't need to talk to you. It was just so weird. But yet she kept pressing me. I'm not kidding you. She followed me around the entire store asking me if I wanted to know my future. And finally, I just said, look, no, I really do know my future. 
And I just, I just, because she was following, she seemed like she wanted a conversation. So I spent the next 45 minutes unpacking the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was like, okay, yeah, she was, she was done with that conversation. You didn't want to have a conversation with me anymore. She kind of fled. She worked there and she left, okay? So that's how that went. <laughs> Okay, but we all have a sense and a desire to know what's next. What, what is the future? And so what I'm going to do for you this morning, free of charge, you can leave an offering if you want. Uh, but <laughs> not for me. We've got to pay the bills. Um, but but uh, free of charge, I am going to let you know your past, your present, and your future. All in the same morning. And I promise you I'm going to do it in a very reasonable amount of time. So, so as we do, let's start out here with our past, which is found right there uh, in, in verse 1. And I'm talking to the believer. So if, if, if you're uh, not a Christian and you're here, man, we love you. We welcome you here. And we're glad you can listen in. You're going to find yourself here in, in the next couple, a few verses. And um, you'll probably hate me uh, by the end of verse 3. But I promise you, if you stick with us, uh, you'll, you'll learn to love me and God. Uh, so verse 1, let's start with our past. Um, the Apostle Paul says to the believers there at Ephesus, uh, and you were uh, dead in your trespasses and sin. This is an uh, absolute statement in the Greek. The Apostle Paul is not messing around. He hasn't at all, the first chapter. And he's coming right out the gates in chapter uh, 2, verse 1, by saying, uh, you uh, were dead. It's an absolute statement. Not, not you might have been dead, perhaps you were dead, you're in danger of death. It wasn't a figure of speech. The Apostle Paul was literally saying, you were dead, flatlined. Have you ever seen a dead body? Let's just get morbid for a moment. Um, uh, maybe, maybe it wasn't like, oh, I saw the guy got shot down. No, maybe it wasn't that. Maybe it was you just went to a funeral. And I, I, listen, I was born in New York. I have no clue why. If you can, every, every funeral you go to in New York, especially Long Island, it's like they're, they're popping the casket. We need to see the body. I, I don't get it, right? It's just I don't want to see that. I'd rather remember who they were. But, but I remember going to a funeral of my uncle, Marty. He was only 40 years old. He had had a heart attack. And they, and they, they had this open uh, casket. And I'm like, open, cat. Dad, what does this mean? You know, I'm a kid. And he's like, it means we're going to see your uncle, but he's, but he's dead. And my dad's trying to explain it to me. But I walk in the room, and I didn't need any more explanation. They're like, you've got to walk up to the casket and pay your respects. I'm like, I'll pay him from back here. Okay, this is weird. And, but yet I did. You know, I, I walked up, and I looked into the casket, and it was so strange. Because I've known my Uncle Marty my whole life, and, and it was like that wasn't my Uncle Marty. It was a shell. It was, it was the, as the Bible describes it, the tent. I mean, I looked in it, but it, but it wasn't him. And it, he even looked different. When you are dead, you cannot do anything to put yourself in a better position, better standing, to be seen uh, in a better light by God. Why? Because you're dead. You don't go to hospitals and see dead people, scalpel, working on themselves. That doesn't happen, right? Why? Because, because they're dead. They can't improve their, com their, their condition. They don't have a heartbeat towards God. And this is what the Apostle Paul is trying to uh, get across to the believers there in Ephesus, that before Christ invaded your life, you were dead spiritually. You did not have a heartbeat toward God. We were in need of an outside influence. We were in need of rebirth, John chapter 3 tells us. Colossians tells us. Furthermore, as we, as we look at the text, we also recognize that it's universal, right? This is not like some of you were dead. No, he said, you were all dead. We were born in sin. There was separation between mankind and God. We were dead. He says there in verse 1, you uh, were dead. You. He's making it personal. Not, listen, not just overtly evil people. Not just people who had done the most heinous crimes. But from top to bottom, regardless of your class, regardless of your social status, we are all dead. And the beauty of that is we all start in the same place. 
dead in our trespasses and sins. And some of you might be thinking, wait a second, did you say like, like dead, dead? I mean, because I, I go to work all the time and I got, I got friends and I, I walk with people on the streets and, and my neighbors and whatnot. And, they, and some of them, they're, they're fit and they're jovial and they, you know, they got, they make, they, there's expressions, they're, they're, you know, they're, I don't know about all this, Jimmy. They're, they're, bringing, they're brimming with personality. And, and, um, um, and, and that may be so in the physical, but the reality is, is uh, spiritually they are flatlined. Spiritually they are uh, dead. In the most important area that we must be alive, there is no life apart from Jesus. And there is, of course, um, moral degrees of corruption. There's moral degrees of sinfulness. Not everybody is as vile and as wicked as the next person. Right? I mean, that's just common sense. I know sometimes we're like, you know, every sin is the same in God's eyes. No, every sin will separate you from God, but not every sin is the same. Now, Corinthians makes that very clear. Um, the Holocaust and stealing a pack of gum, a little different. Okay? It is in God's eyes too. Both, both of them will cause you to miss out on heaven. Because we cannot stand before a holy and perfect God with, with any sin present. Which is why you've got to wait for the good news in just a moment. But there are, are moral degrees of, of, of how vile and how wicked an individual can be. I, I get that. I get that. Just as Jairus, the, the, his daughter who had passed away in Luke chapter 8. Remember, she, she had just died and Jesus rolled up on the scene and, and resurrected her from the dead. Just as in, in uh, what is it, uh, I can't, in the Gospel of John with Lazarus, he was dead for how many days? Four days, okay? There was some decay going on. Jesus rolls up on the scene there and what happens? Jesus, no, no, no. Jesus is like, roll the stone away. They're like, no, we can't roll the stone. It's going to smell. Okay, it's, it's, they literally say that to him. It's going to smell. We can't roll the stone away, but Jesus does it anyway. And Jesus uh, speaks out and Lazarus is, is risen from the dead. D Listen, he was for sure more decayed than Jairus' daughter, but the same might, the same power was needed to, to resurrect them from the dead. And in the same way, whether you sin big or sin little, we still have sinned. We've still fallen short. Whether you've done something overtly crazy or it's just the motivations of your heart have been off from time to time. The same power, the same might is needed to resurrect you. And so we were dead. Some of us more decayed, more vile, more corrupted, but all in, needed, in need of new life. And notice what it says in verse 1. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. See, sinning is missing the mark. That's all that means. We create, we, we, we treat it like this dirty word. What, what it really means is, is I've missed the mark. I've sinned. Trespasses is a little bit different. Trespasses is if you were to walk up to someone's property and it said no trespassing, you understand that if you trespass, if you pass that border, you're guilty. Knowing that you still do that, that is a trespassing. It's willfully sinning. And the Apostle Paul stating that we were dead in our trespasses and sin, not to... Um, um, not to separate or itemize our sins, but rather to help us understand the breadth of our sin. That it's not just the sins we willfully commit, but the sins that we commit even unknowingly separate us from God, um, cause us a spiritual death. And so Paul here begins to support this uh, thesis by pointing out that those who are spiritually dead are under the sway of, in the next two verses, um, the world, the devil, and the flesh, in that order. The world, the devil, and the flesh. We are in the sway of those things. These are um, uh, ways in which, avenues in which we find ourselves on this path to destruction, away from uh, the presence of God. And so... Uh, here, Paul, in 
uh, verse 2 says, in which you uh, once walked according to the course of this world. What is the course of this world? What is walking according to the course of this world mean? See, because even the world has some semblance of morality, doesn't it? I mean, I mean, that's why you have dudes who are not Christian, don't want anything to do with Jesus, but will still go to church to find a girl. Because nobody is like, man or woman is like, yeah, I, I can't wait to find that debased, wretched person to spend the rest of my life with. No, because we have certain standards even outside of Christ. There, there, there is a, a, a certain understanding of right and wrong. God has placed eternity in our hearts. And yet, the word, co- the word world here is, is the word a cosmos. It's not speaking of the world as in creation, but the world system. That we were all on a path, the course of this world world, the world's uh, system, the world's system of values, the world's system of um, uh, to do and not to do things. Uh, We once walked in the course of the world's standards of right and wrong. It says we once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. This is the course then of uh, the devil. When uh, living in our sins, Paul's saying, the devil was our master and we were being led by his will. And I know that some of this stuff for you, if if you're in here today and you're like, I don't know, what? I'm talking about the devil and demons. Is that stuff even real? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, it is. And not a lot of people talk about it, but it's biblical. It's in the Bible. And so at Roots Church, what we do is we teach the Bible verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept. I'm not just going to teach you what I think. I'm going to teach you what the Bible says. Because what I think is not nearly as important as what God says. And what God says is that every single person who has been birthed into this world was, was not only born in sin, but were on the course of the world's systems and values. Were, were uh, the, the, the prince of the world, is Satan. Where Satan is also called the, the god of this age. Where he is in control. And it's not that, you know, the devil made me do it. We have that kind of mentality as well, don't we? I know my pastor's pastor, Dave Shirley, he preached here once uh, before in the past. Um, He always tells this story about when he was at Bible college and he got kicked out. It was down south. He was at Bible college. And he had, in the middle of the night, climbed up the giant water tower and spray painted, the devil made me do it. Um, And the next day, they found all the spray cans in his room and they kicked him out of Bible college. Um, And so that was, now he's the director of a Bible college, but um, the vice president, actually. So, uh, but, but the point being is we love to play the blame game, right? Well, it's the world's fault. It's all the outside influences. Oh, the devil made me do it. And what we fail to take responsibility for is that it's not just uh, the devil, it's not just demonic forces, it's not just the the world systems, but rather it's also, look at verse 3, among whom also we conducted ourselves or lived in the passions and lusts of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Paul's point is, yes, uh, Satan uh, dominates and energizes the spiritually dead, but it's not just the devil making you do it. It's not just all of the world systems, but it's also, it's also we battle from within. We have a sin nature, our flesh longs for things that are not uh, of God. And here we see the word lust used, and it's being used in a negative connotation. I know that immediately when I say the word lust, there is a specific type of sin that you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I struggle with that. Uh, but that, it's, he's not even speaking about it in sexual terms. The Apostle Paul, when, he, when he's speaking about lust here, he's talking about any unlawful desire of any kind. Of any kind. And we once conducted ourselves, we once past tense, before Christ, we once conducted ourselves or lived in the passions or lusts of our flesh. And we were by nature children of wrath like 
the rest of mankind. Again, speaking of the fact that we were born in sin. We were born unclean, born unholy. Uh, listen, I have two little kids. So before you're like, no, kids are perfect little angels. No, they're not, okay? There's a lot of things we don't teach them that they just do. And you're kind of like, wow, I can see how selfish you are at one. You know, so, so uh, John the Baptist uh, put it this way in John 3.36. Uh, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Now, if we're honest, and I asked you the question, do you recognize your past here? For those of us who are redeemed, we are bought by the blood of Jesus, we are, we are saved, we are secure, we know where our home is. We're going to say, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, that... That once was me. I was once ruled by my flesh. I was once um, I'm heavily influenced by um, demonic forces. I, I, I was definitely walking in the way of the world's system of values. That, yeah, that was me. And I was dead in my trespasses and sins. And for some, you're just kind of like on the fence right now. You're, you're kinda, you're kinda, you go to church. You'd even probably consider yourself a Christian. You're like, yeah, if, you mean, if somebody asked, I'd tell them, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. You know, I go to church every once in a while and feel like I'm a pretty good person. Um, you probably right now are thinking, mm, no, no, I don't know about all this stuff, right? I know, I know that I live for myself, but the stuff you're talking about, that's not me. Well, hang on, because uh, you, you, you need to begin. You can just, you can check out right now. And what you need to do is just meditate for the rest of this service uh, on the realities of your heart. Because if you don't get that part, you'll never be able to embrace the good news that's coming next. See, because when we don't embrace the fact uh, that, that we are a completely depraved people born into it, we then muddy our understanding of the atonement of Christ. Because why do we need an atonement? Why, why would God even need to send His Son on a rescue mission to save us if I'm just good enough to do it myself? The answer is He wouldn't have needed to. But because you're not, he needed to. He needed to send Jesus. And so instead of sitting here this morning and kicking against the goads and, well, that's not me, just embrace the fact that you were or perhaps are dead in your trespasses and sin. And then you might embrace the good news that comes next because you don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay there. Jesus loves you is not just a bumper sticker or something we put on a t-shirt. It's, it's reality. I mean, it, it's so real that, that it's not just mere words on a page. It's not, not just a, a, a mere slogan that we put on a, a sticker. It is something that has been displayed in human history. You and I can never, ever, ever question the love of God for us. We can't question God's love. We may struggle sometimes understanding it or embracing it, but we cannot deny the love of God because the love of God was proven throughout human history the day that God left the beautiful, wonderful riches of heaven to come to this cesspool called earth to be pinned to a cross for you and I. To be spit on, to be mocked, to be murdered for you and I. Because he loves us. Because he, lo because he knew, he knew that you would remain in that state of death if he didn't do something, if he didn't take action, and because he loved you so much, he took action. He took action and he made a way. He made a way. Not 10 ways, not 15 ways, not whatever you think and you believe, as long as you're a good person. That's nonsense. He made a way. Jesus said in John chapter 14, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And apart from me, nobody's going to heaven. That's what Jesus said. So before you, you, you start spewing off, well, I believe Jesus was a good teacher and a good rabbi. No, 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 no. He said, apart from him, you're going to hell. That's what he said. Jesus said that. So you either embrace the sacrifice that Christ made that we're about, to re we're about to read right now or just miss me with all of the, you know, Jesus was this hippie that picked flowers through a field and that's not the biblical Jesus. Jesus. 
the end of verse 3, we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Do you recognize your past here? That whether you were a big sinner or a little sinner, you were dead. You were dead. You know, I don't even like to... I share my testimony every once in a while, and I especially share my testimony when I'm sharing my faith. We talked about that at um, men's ministry yesterday, um, about the importance of sharing our testimony in evangelism, because nobody can take that from us. Um, and I share my testimony often, but, I, but most of the time I leave a lot out. Because I, I don't know about you, but I find sometimes you got people that share their testimony and they're just glorying in their past. <laughs> I hate my past. My past, in some ways, is, is what defines me because it, it led me to where I am today. It led me to Jesus. It led me to the cross. But when I begin to talk about what an angry person I was, when I begin to talk about how I, would, I loved to fight, it didn't matter how big you were, I didn't even care. Because I'm short, it, it didn't, I had no problems finding fights. It was awesome, right? Because I loved it. I have been in more physical confrontations than you can count. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I love to fight. I punched a guy in the face because he beat me at Madden 2K <laughs> something. All right, that was, that was how angry I was. But listen, but when I look at the old man, I reckon him dead. Because that's the old man. It's not who I am anymore. So when I run into somebody from my past who's like, oh, Jimmy, remember when we used to? I'm like, to be honest with you, I really don't. Or, yeah, I do, and that's weird, <laughs> because it is so foreign to me. It's another life. It's another person. It was the dead me. I was dead in my trespasses and sin. And I understand that, and I recognize that. Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, in the very beginning, God said, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Jeremiah 17, 9, you know the verse, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Isaiah 64, 6 says, but we were all like an unclean thing and all of our righteousness was as filthy rags. In other words, on your best day, you weren't good enough. Who in the scriptures is often referred to as uh, unclean, especially in the, the Old Testament. There's a lot of people, but lepers, lepers, were constantly referred to as unclean. As a matter of fact, there were Levitical laws. When lepers uh, were walking through your town, they needed to hold their finger above their lip and below their nose, and they needed to shout at the top of their lungs, unclean, unclean, so that people could, could part the way. If I were to have brought a leper to church today, you would have smelt him from blocks away. The rotting flesh, the pus, the blood, all of the things that ooze out of somebody with that condition. Now, I could have brought an individual in that room and I could have wrapped them in beautiful silk. And it would have been only a matter of moments before that pus, that blood, that, that rotting flesh began to seep through that silk. That is a picture of what many of us try to do with our sin. I'll just, I'll just be better and I'll, I'll do something better or I'll, or I'll hide it so nobody else knows and we fail to realize that God knows and God sees. Our righteousness is a filthy rag. By nature, I was deserving of God's wrath. By nature, I was deserving of God's judgment. But here's the good news. Look at verse 4. But God. <laughs> but God. If those aren't the greatest two words after reading what we just read, but you were dead, but God. I've told you about your past and now it's on to your present, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love in which He has loved us. Do you understand how significant this but God is? You were dead, but God. You were steeped in sin, but God. 
You had no hope of heaven but God. You were hopeless but God. You were lost but God. You were ruled by Satan but God. Your path, your direction in life was awaiting the wrath of God and eternal judgment but God who is rich in mercy. Who is rich in mercy. That word mercy means not getting what we deserve. God who is rich in mercy. He's not giving us what we deserve. <laughs> it's amazing. That's incredible. Where does this rich mercy flow from? What does it say in the text? It flows from the fountain of His great love. His great mercy flows from the fountain of His great love that He has for you and I. I want you to notice the end of verse 4 there. His great love with which He has loved us. Past tense. There's something so beautiful about that line. The, the love that God has for you. The love that He has loved, past tense, you with. Well, well at what point in time did God... Uh, love us, a uh, past tense. What does this mean? It, it, it's clear in the text that it happened in a moment of time. Well, when in times past has his, was his love displayed once and for all? It was on the cross. John chapter 15, verse 13, greater love is none than this, than one who'd be willing to lay down his life for his friends, and he calls you friends, John chapter 15. Romans 5, 8, Christ demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, it says, In this is love, not that we love God, but that he first loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for us. There was a, a point in time that God sent his son and proved that uh, love. I can't understand that love. Maybe you have a better understanding. I can't even comprehend it. It is so mind-blowing to me. I, I, I've told the story in times past of, of taking my nephew to church. One, This is many, many moons ago. But taking my nephew in California to church, and while we were driving to church, he was going through that stage where he was asking why about everything. What are we doing? We're going to church. Why? Well, we're going to like, study the Bible. So why? Because it's good for you. Why? Because it teaches us about God. Why? Because Jesus loves us. Why? I don't know. I don't have a real great theological answer for that question. I know he loves us. And no doubt there have been books and commentaries and volumes written on the subject of God's love towards us, but I'm stumped at why. I'm so undeserving of his great grace and love towards me. Because everything in my life my thoughts and feelings towards him were so lukewarm. The actions, that, the, the direction that I was walking in, I wasn't concerned about him. What? The Bible says, Romans 5, 8, that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. While we didn't give a rip about God, he died for us. While we were cursing his name and spitting in his face, Christ died for us. The love of God, to me, is the most profound thing in the universe. Even when we were dead in trespasses, verse 5. He made us alive with Christ by how? By grace you have been saved through faith. Again, again, it's that word trespass. It's that, it's that willful sinning. It's not just that we were uh, making mistakes here and there. We were willfully sinning against uh, God and knowing what was right. We were doing what was wrong. We, we, while we were living lives with our backs turned to God, doing our own thing, living for self-pleasure. And Jesus said, I came to give life and that more abundantly. Do we get that? Do we understand that the life God, God came to kind of impute to us was, was a life with purpose, with a life, a life with hope, an abundant life? That's grace. That is the grace of God. It's not just um, uh, not getting what we deserve, but it's getting what we don't deserve. That is the grace of God that is used, charis, 156 times throughout the New Testament. 
The kind of grace that blows your mind. The kind of grace that flows from God's love that is not based on your performance. It's not based on your performance. It has nothing to do with how good you can be. I, want you, I, feel, I, feel, I did a lot of good things this week and I feel like God loves me more. No, He doesn't. He doesn't love you more. He can't love you more. He loves you with an everlasting love that is beyond comprehension. <laughs> that is the God that we serve. Titus chapter 3, uh, verse 4 through 6. Um, the Apostle Paul writes, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. What does it say? Not because of our uh, of, of righteous things we have done, but because of His Mercy, He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our uh, Savior. It is not based on your performance, but based on the love of God. There is not a greater relationship you can have in the world. And He raised Him, verse 6, up. He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We, we saw in chapter 1, verse 20, Paul said that, that Jesus Christ is seated in the heavenlies. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says that He's at the right hand of the Father. So why is this important to us? Why, why is this text important to us that, that Paul would pen, that God would author, that you and I as believers are, are positionally we're already with God? It's important to us because it speaks of our exaltation. It speaks of the fact that, that, that we are already seated in the heavenly places. Practically, we're here on earth. But the way that God sees us is as saved, as secured, as sealed with the Holy Spirit, and already seated in the heavenly places. He's paid for that. We need to live our lives because of that, worthy of the calling. Notice, notice, it doesn't say that He raised us up and made us sit together in heavenly places uh, next to Christ, but in Christ. But in Christ. Why, why does He say it that way? Because, in other words, uh, as we live our lives in Christ, it, we live our lives in His power, in His strength, in His victory, in His authority. We are now new creations in Christ Jesus. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new, 2 Corinthians 5.17. We're new. We have new nature. We have new position, new standing uh, before the Lord. And so I've told you your past, and now you know your present, and now I'm going to tell you your future. This is what everybody's been waiting for. I know it. Uh, and so verse 7 is where the Apostle Paul dives into that. He says, uh, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. It says the coming ages, S at the end. Notice that. It's not speaking about the millennial reign. That's the coming age. It's talking about, in the Greek, it, it's actually speaking about, it's an expression for eternity. In the coming ages. In other words, we are going to spend eternity learning about the great grace of God. We will never fully be able to wrap our minds, even in our new bodies, around the um, eternal greatness of the grace of God. His grace is that big and that great. And for some of you, the only thing you know about God's grace is that you've been saved by it, right? You have not begun to explore how great the grace of God is in your life. You're still at base camp. When the Bible says that there is the manifold grace of God, there are many folds to God's grace. And as you walk within Him, and as you love Him, and as you pursue Him, you begin to explore and understand and comprehend just a little bit more, just a little bit more, just a little bit more of how great His grace is towards you and I. We serve a good God. We have a great Savior. There was an old song by an old Christian band. 
And one of the lyrics said, There will be a day when all will fade away and all that will remain is loving you face to face. What a glorious future we have in Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Verse 8. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift from God. Not as a result of works so that one may boast. It's a, it's a gift. It's a gift. How many of you know gifts are free? If, if you've ever received a gift and then you got a receipt and it wasn't a gift receipt, in other words, it was a person saying, well, this is how much it costs. I'm going to need that back. I know. <laughs> okay. um, uh, that wasn't a gift. <laughs> okay, and you need new friends. Uh, let's just get that straight. Um, uh, gifts are free. But someone can give you a gift and you can take that gift and you can store it in your closet and you cannot open it. You have to receive the free gift of God because you can reject it. Receive the gift that God has given. I love this word saved here. Let me tell you why. I love the word saved because it's in the perfect tense, which, which indicates that it's, a, it's a, an action that happened in the past. It's in the perfect tense. You were, you were saved. It happened uh, in the past. Uh, and, and it had, uh, never had anything to do with, with what you brought to the table. It's, all, it, it's in the passive as well. It's in the passive, which means it's an action that happened to you. You were saved. So down with this kind of pagan notion, notion that, well, would you just be a good person? Just make sure your good outweighs your bad. And, and then in the end, of course he's going to forgive you. After all, you weren't Jeffrey Dahmer. You know, you weren't Bin Laden. And we start to, we always go to the extremes too. It's like, well, I'm not as bad as that guy that just killed all those kids. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, um, but this is not a biblical way of thinking. This kind of scale of my good will outweigh my, that's not biblical. That's worldly. I love this story that Kent Hughes um, writes in his commentary. He talks about a, if a plane crashed in the South Atlantic and on that plane was a, an Olympic swimmer and there was an individual who couldn't swim at all and then an individual who could, he could, he could swim. Not an Olympic swimmer, but he could swim. And this plane went down and they're kind of floating in the debris and, and they were a thousand miles off of shore. And he said, the Olympic swimmer said, follow me. And he jumped into the water and began to swim. And they're all kind of, okay. Well, and they jumped in and they began to swim after him. Um, within 30 seconds, the person who couldn't swim is down. Like they're, they're just kind of chilling, Davy Jones locker style. You know, they're done, right? And then about uh, an hour later, the guy who was like a moderate swimmer is kind of like, okay, I'm done. And he just kind of, you know, takes a plunge into the deep. But the Olympic swimmer, he's going for it. 25 hours later, he's, he's, he's swam 50 miles. He's only got 475 hours and 950 more miles to go if he swims at that pace the whole time. In other words, uh, not a chance. There's, there's no uh, chance. It's, as, it's as about as beneficial as rearranging the chairs on the Titanic. It's still going down. <laughs> it's going down. And, and if you are, are saved by anything but grace through faith, you will then have reason for boasting. Well, I got here because I climbed up here. I flew up here. I, whatever. I, I spent 18 hours a day going door to door. I, I helped old ladies cross the street. I, I, it's not going to happen when you get... It's not, well, I served the widows and orphans. Praise God. Those are great things that you've done, okay? And, but, but those things should be the, the fruit of your salvation, um, not what got you there. Because I can promise you this. When you uh, stand before God, when you enter into heaven... No one is going to be sitting in the corner talking about how they rode their 18-speed bicycle with their little name tag on going door to door. For, it's not going to happen. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, lest anyone should boast, the Bible says. There's no room for boasting. We're saved, verse 9, not of the works, lest anyone should boast, for we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The word workmanship is only used twice in the New Testament. Just two times. The first time is, is in Romans chapter 1 verse 20 speaking of God's the testimony of creation. 
And this is what it says. It says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, that they are without excuse. The phrase, the things that were made in the Greek can be translated a poema. In other words, God's creation sings to the glory of who He is. So for that individual in Papua New Guinea who's never heard of God, Romans chapter 1 says, creation speaks of the glory of Jesus. It's his workmanship. It's his poem. And the second time it's used is here in Ephesians chapter 2. Speaking of you and I. That we are his poem. That we are his artwork. We are his um, craftsmanship. Mankind is the apex of God's creation. You may go to the most beautiful place in the world. You may overlook cliffs and see sunsets that are just breathtaking and water that is crystal clear. And and you may rejoice at creation, God's poem in creation. But I would submit to you that you and I, created in the image of God, are the apex of God's creation. I love what St. Augustine says. This is what St. Augustine wrote. He said, Men go abroad to wonder at the height of mountains, at the huge waves of the sea, at the long courses of the rivers, at the vast compass of the season, at the circular motion of the stars, and they pass by themselves without a wondering. When God looks at all of those things and says, it is good, but when God looks at you and I, we are the apple of his eye. We are his a treasure, Deuteronomy tells us. God loves you and I with, with a passionate love that, that not even angels and created things can experience. How crazy is that? Angels who are so perfectly obedient and yet we oftentimes, if we're honest, we, we're like Bambi. We're tripping all over ourselves and yet God loves us with a love that is so incomprehensible. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works. His desire is that we would be manifesting these good works in our lives as a result of salvation. We don't work for salvation, but we work from salvation. Because God has lavished us with such rich blessings in His Son Jesus, because of that I serve Him. Because He has been so good to me, I will do anything for him. Because I know that James 2.20, faith without works is dead. The Lord produces those good works in us. He has prepared them beforehand. The last portion of the verse before we close. He's prepared them beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, I used to despise the book of James when I first got saved. Right, because it's like it's just like a book towards the end of the New Testament, and I had already written, I'd, I'd read the Gospels, and I I read the Pauline epistles, and I'm like, yeah, this is all, by grace through faith. And then all of a sudden, James comes on the scene talking about works, and I'm like, seriously, dude, I can understand why Martin Luther burned this book. You know, I had all of these kind of, and yet when you truly understand, there there is no contradiction. What James is saying is, if you are a Christian, if you name the name of Christ and you don't live for Him, are you really saved? Has His grace, has His love, has His righteousness really been imputed to you if there is no change in your life? Well, I said a prayer one time at a a crusade. Well, that doesn't make you saved, okay? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Has His righteousness been imputed to you? Because... A result of that will be obedience. It will be obedience to the call of God on your life. It'll be an obedience to uh, His Word. As we walk with Jesus, those works will be a natural byproduct. And so here's how I want to close. Let's spend today, let's spend this week, let's spend this month, actually, let's spend the rest of our lives, the rest of our lives, meditating on, exploring, walking in the rich mercy that God has to offer, the everlasting love of Jesus, and the eternal grace that God has to offer us. And you, you may be here this morning, and, and you, you may be in need of breakthrough in your life. 
and you're like, this, this wasn't a practical enough message. Well, sometimes, you know what? Actually, most of the time, Bible studies are not about you. <laughs> okay? We, we've got this weird thing within the church where we're just like, well, you know, I went to church today, but I didn't really get a lot out of it. Well, it's not about you. Okay? It's about God. Uh, And so if you can't come to a place where the the word of God is being taught and walk out of that place going, man, I know so much more about Jesus and his love for me. I know so much more about the process of salvation that we can't walk out of here rejoicing over the fact that we are loved by God. That's all the practicality I need. I don't know about you. Okay? So I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what kind of mess your life may be in. Maybe you're in an extremely frustrating season. I understand that. I've been there many times. You may be overwhelmed. You may be exhausted. What you need to hear and what you need to remember and what you need to embrace this morning as you go your way is this. Um, But God, regardless of where you are, regardless of what you're going through, there is always a but God. The message is more powerful than your circumstance. Believe that. Embrace that. Apply that. But God, but God, but God over everything in your life. And Jesus, we thank you so much for the riches of the glory of your grace towards us.